wonderful. Well, um, it's a season of lasts uh, for me and uh, my family. And uh, this is the last sermon I'll ever get to preach as an elder at X1. So if it gets a little emotional, please deal with that. That's who I am. Um, and uh, it's, it's amazing. Part of the actual substance of Advent itself is coming to grips with realities rather than kind of living out some sort of triumphalistic Christianity that thinks that victory is always staying on a high and being up in the clouds. Uh, Advent reminds us that's precisely not the case. And it's a, a slight irony that um, I said to my wife this morning, you know, when you have children, the cost of love is that you give up your selfishness. You must live for them. And so this morning, my wife can't be with me to hear the last ever sermon I'll preach as an elder uh, because our third son is sick. And that's part of Advent. Sons aren't meant to be sick, sick when your wife is supposed to be listening to you preach this last sermon, but that's life. And that does happen. And that is reality. And sometimes we try and live maybe a Christmas lifestyle rather than an Advent lifestyle. And I hope that something of what comes through the message today will reach deep into your hearts and form you. I must admit, we did have a funny conversation together as a family that we, we kind of hoped that it would never be the case, but if it had to be the case, that it would be in about 10 to 15 years that we would be uh, opening the door to our son, puking on the doorstep at 1 a.m. in the morning, but it happened last night. Um, Macy James was staying a night with his uh, nan, and uh, she called us at 20 to 1 and said, uh, Macy James is sick as a dog, I'm going to bring him over, what do you think? Yes, let's do that, as Curie opened the door, Blah, all over the door. So there was a kind of humor to it, which is also Advent. If you don't find beauty and ugliness, you're not going to live life well. Two weeks ago, we traveled down to my sister's. At junction 10A of the M23, we turned off onto the B2036. And we traveled through the villages of Balcom and Cookfield to reach our final destination, the town of Haywards Heath. That's where my sister lives. And to give you a little taste of what that road is like before I continue, this is the Osme, I think it is, uh, aqueduct that is part of the rail line from London to Brighton. And there's another picture here, uh, the next slide. That is what you drive through as you travel along the BO, B2036. And as we turned onto that road a fortnight ago, a sensation came upon me as we entered the tunnel formed by the canopy of woodland trees embracing one another, grappling in an array of contortions in order to assert their role as guardians of this ancient path. For 15 years I have traveled that road, winter, spring, summer and autumn. As a young 22-year-old man fresh off the plane from Zimbabwe, as a 25-year-old man questioning his place, his purpose, and his part in the great story of the ages. As a 28-year-old man responding to a calling to lead in the United Kingdom, alone but for dreams and the immovable presence of the Spirit of God impressing upon me his mission to the nations. Then again, as a man traveling with the woman, he wondered if he would be worthy to one day call his wife, and again with that future bride having just said yes to his request for his hand in marriage. Then as a newly married man, certain... I knew love, yet having only turned the first page, investigating the preface of that truly remarkable story that is the love of man and wife. I could continue. I've traveled that road as a man expecting his first son, as a father, as a father of two, as a father of three, and so on. Each time I've submitted to the beckoning of those ancient guardians, and I am moved to the core haunted by an incomprehensibly deep ache that is a mix of remembrance and longing, of gratitude and naive expectation. Something happens to me every time we enter that road. As we submit ourselves to these grappling, contorting trees, forming a canopy, a tunnel, something happens in my heart, and it happened again two weeks ago. And to explain this want, this yearning, would be to would be to detract from its beauty. 
to reduce that which must remain shrouded in mystery. But what I do want to say to you this morning, X1, is, is that this something evoked by the B2036 is at the heart of the season we call Advent. The something that happens in this individual man taking his journey through life every time I enter that road, the sort of concoction of feelings of longing, of hopes and dreams and wonders about what is ahead, and yet coupled with this remembering and this sort of wondering, what have I been in the past? What is the meaning of life? What, what is, it sort of happens to me every time I enter that road, and I think that's at the heart of the season we call Advent, which begins today. Next slide. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, this morning, because I feel we've lost our understanding of this, that entering into Advent is a rebellion against secular structures. It is saying we will live by the time of the Lord. It is a refusal to be defined by shallow, weak fairy tales. A rejection of the insatiable demands of a consumer society. Entering into Advent is living out the very opposite of Black Friday. Entering into Advent is saying that we as the people of God will be those who await their promises. We will be those who wait in pain and in sorrow and expectation, but we will wait and we will trust and we will long and we will expect and we will hope. Entering into Advent is a returning to the time of the church, celebrating the deepest, greatest story and patiently embracing the selfless, sacrificial way of the Savior. Brothers and sisters, to be those people of Advent is to be rebels. It's to be those who live like John the Baptist. Next slide. Advent is when we as followers of Jesus are to resolve to bring to the very center of ourselves the reality of being a people who live in the time between times. We resolve to remember and to hope. To remember that the King has come, placenta and all, in a manner too marvelous to comprehend, all the while hopeful that the same King will come again, heavenly entourage of angels and all, in a manner too majestic to imagine. Entering into Advent is a decisive maneuver to live in awe of the paradox of God as a baby. A commitment to the startling reality that in the incarnation, a new world was begun. And that the strife of global history, what we live in day by day as we look to the stories coming out of the Middle East, as we look to the stories of the Far East, as we look in our own nation, as we look across the seas and we think upon Ferguson and all the events around it, we are a people that realize in Advent that the strife of global history is because a new world within an old world, cannot help but be a world in crisis. We are those who realize because Christ has come and the new has begun, He started reorchestrating the world. We are those who are aware that the strife and the pain and the sorrow and the difficulty is because a world such as that is bound to be in crisis. As this new world is longing to break through and come through and reveal its glory and its majesty, the whole world is aching for that. It means it's a world in crisis. And so as we enter Advent, we, we are living out the sense of who we are as a people. And this morning, it is our hope as those who are His people. The one side of that deep, deep ache that strikes me every time we drive down the B2036 that I want to gaze upon together for a time. Advent. You see, the Israelites looked to the Adventus. That's where Advent comes from, the Latin word uh, Adventus, or, or Greek word Adventus, sorry. The Israelites looked to the Adventus, the coming, the arrival of the Messiah. All through the scriptures, starting in Genesis chapter 3, there is an allusion to, and then going through every single passage of scripture again and again, we're reminded that the Israelites were waiting for the Messiah. Over 400 scriptures outline his birth, life, death, resurrection, and return in the Old Testament. Did you know that? 
400 scriptures in the Old Testament are this, in the state of longing, the state of expectation, the state of waiting. And then as we open the Gospels and we turn to the book of Luke, we see those like Simeon and the prophetess Anna, those like Mary and Joseph and Elizabeth and Zechariah, hoping for his coming. Simeon is this old, old man who hung around the temple, known by all in Jerusalem as devout and religious, or in Galilee, sorry, as devout and religious. And he is waiting. His whole life is built around this hope that the Messiah will come. Anna, this prophetess, said, now she can go because she has seen the promised one. And she holds up God as a baby before her eyes. Mary says yes because she cannot believe that she would be the one who would bring into the world the hope of Israel. Elizabeth and Zechariah, they hoped. The Israelites lived in hope and expectation. And we, the church, are those who, while remembering the amazing story of Emmanuel, God with us, we are those who are remade and those who wait in hope for the return of the King. That's who we are as the church. We are the people of Advent. We are the people aching for, longing for, living in this turmoil, living in this time between times, waiting for the return of the King. And our readings drive home how we as the people of God, those who patiently enter Advent while the world dives aggressively into Black Friday, these readings drive home how we are to live. We're different. We're, we're renewed. We live in a different way. We aren't those who must crazily, whilst trampling those who are in wheelchairs or those who are too slow to move forward, grabbing TVs, grabbing screens, grabbing whatever it may be on these deals, impatiently rushing in to get some momentary high. We are different. We are those who wait. We are those who live in a different way. And our readings allude to that. Next slide. Next slide. If it's working, it might not be. Isaiah 40 tells us that we are those who prepare and herald the glory of the Lord. We are those who declare the good news of the Lord God Almighty in power. We are those who live those lives pointing to the one who will come. We are those who live in a different way. We are those who, who are saying there is a coming king who is mighty in power, who also gently shepherds his compassion. He's already come, that's how we know this, and he will come again. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that we are those who are patient. We are those who must wait well. We are those who must wait in purity and devotion. The Apostle Peter even tells us that we are those who can actively hasten the coming of the day of God. Have you, I don't know if you've read that, that, that sense that the way we live, how we live, and who we live around, and the way we love our neighbors, and the way we act out what it is to be those who love the Lord God with all of our heart, and all of our soul, and all of our mind, are actively hastening the day that Christ returns. It's an unbelievable responsibility. It's an unbelievable sense that we, the church, can live in such a way as to hasten the coming of the day of God. And in Mark chapter 1, this wonderful introduction to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, singles out one individual, as Dan highlighted last week, singles out John the Baptizer. And what the scriptures are trying to say to us this morning is that those who are the people of Advent, those who are the church, we who live differently, we who aren't defined by Black Friday and Christmas season, but are defined by Advent and all that that means, are a people who live like John the Baptizer. That our lives are meant to be lives that live out what it is to be John the Baptizer in our time. Mark chapter 1 talks about us living lives, that John lived a life that prepared the way of the Lord. Is your life preparing the way of the Lord? 
Is the way you talk, is the way you spend, is the way you think, is the way you work, is the way you love, is the way you father or mother, is the way you interact with those that are the people of God, preparing the way of the Lord, or is it distracting from the way of the Lord? Because the scriptures point us to this one, John the Baptist, who we are meant to look like and live like in order to be those who hasten the coming of the day of God. We live lives that point to the great one. We live lives that don't point to ourselves as great ones. We live lives that point to the great one. As, as, as John says, and he preached saying, after me comes one who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals are not even worthy to stoop down and untie. Humility and a life of pointing to Christ in humble, obedient, sacrificial living is what we're called to do while we wait. So many of our songs impatiently demand the glory of God now. To be a Christian is to wait in expectation. Not to demand now, but to wait and to live a life that points prophetically to the coming of the one. The scriptures say to us that as we wait, as we hope, as we expect, as we long, we are to live as one distinguished from the world by a lifestyle of prophetic pointing. John lived distinguished from the world. John ate locusts and honey and wore uh, the clothing of uh, wild um, camel's hair, it says, camel's hair, and he was distinct, he was different. People flocked to him, perhaps not even for his message, but because of his distinctiveness. There was something so meaningful and so distinct about him that people came to him. And our problem is, and my problem is, my problem, one of the problems I have in my life is that I'm so indistinct from the world because I watch the same shows, I put the same stuff on Facebook, I'm driven by the same incentives, I long and ache for the same sort of value to be given to me by peers that I don't look different to the world. My life isn't prophetic. But as we enter Advent, we remember and we look to John the Baptist and realize that we are meant to live distinctively to the world, living lives that are prophetic. Example, how can your life be a prophetic pointing in your high school? How can your life be distinct and different? I, I, I don't even know how that would look today. But the scriptures are saying to us that those who wait, those who are expecting, those who are longing for the coming, the return of the king, are distinguished because their life is prophetic. I want my life to be prophetic. I want the way that my family lives to be prophetic. I want my bank statements to be prophetic. I want my TV habits and my Netflix habits or maybe not actually getting Netflix because I realize how distracting and destructive it can be to be prophetic. That's what I want for my family. Do you want that? Do you want that for yourselves? Do you want that for your family? Because it's only good we only have to do it for a day because Jesus is coming tomorrow. Well, no, Advent reminds us that actually it could be thousands of years. And the only reason he's patient is because he's hoping that others will respond to his gospel call. And so I'm asking you to live prophetically. Advent asks us to live prophetically for our whole lives. To not be a now people, to not be a demanding people, to not be a people who says, God must bring his glory now, but to be a people that says, I will wait. I will wait. Whilst living prophetically. So the key question that we have to ask ourselves, the key question I ask myself is, how on earth do we live like this? What enables us, what empowers us and strengthens us to live like this? Do you want to know the answer to that question? Our hope. 
It is our hope that helps us to live in such a way that we are prophetic and that we point to God for however long it may be, through whatever circumstance we may live, it is our hope that gets us through. It's our hope that enables us. It's our hope that empowers us. It's our hope that strengthens us. Do you know, I hear so little conversation about our hope. I had a funny moment the other, I think, it might have been someone in this context, no, it was actually in the context of, uh, um, I was speaking at Westminster Chapel students um, event, and someone said something about uh, almost locking out the fact that there was anything distinctive about hope as a, as a Christian people. And I just pointed to Colossians 1 verse 5, which we'll look at today, which basically says, it is simply and purely because of our hope that we can even expect, according to Paul, to live like Christians. So I want to take a brief discussion and a brief time to just talk about our hope. So what does the word hope in Scripture mean? Well, it's understood in two ways, as you can see. It's an eager anticipation or waiting. And now you can think back to the sense that I get as I enter onto the B2036. There's a, I don't know what it is, guys, but something comes over me and I, I hope that it'll be as special as it's always been seeing my sister. I hope that I'll be the man that my wife longs for me to be and the prophet that God demands me to be. This time I said to Kiri, I hope to write a book that could perhaps be paved by the narrative of what I feel every time I drive along this road. There's an eager anticipation. And those who are people of hope, we the church, we are those who eagerly anticipate or wait. We await the coming of the dawn. We await the final and complete victory. We await the returning of the king, the breaking in of the full glory of God. We await the restoration of all things. We await a new heavens and a new earth marked with truth, goodness and beauty that we live with a deep longing for in every moment of our existence. That's what we're waiting for. No one's too excited about that, but it's a pretty decent one for me personally. But hope is also confident expectation, sorry, it's the same slide, my bag. Confident expectation based in certainty. You know what the alarming thing about Advent is? Is that it's a crushing paradox of what it is to be the people of God because we wait by remembering. We look forward by looking back. We anticipate by restoring our vision of what has already happened. We wait by immersing ourselves in this narrative that assures us of a God who loves so completely, so fully, that He gives Himself to right the wrongs, to bring light, as Galadriel would say, to the darkness creeping relentlessly into the heart of the world. We look forward by looking back. We expectantly wait by basing our hope on the certainty of the God who has come and who has promised He will come again. So I just want to go through a brief expose of hope. Here's some thoughts just in studying the idea of hope that comes through, and I'm going to read some verses. Hope is our gospel impetus. Why do we share the gospel? Well, Paul said he shared the gospel because it was the hope of Israel. How do I know that? Acts chapter 26, verse 6. Paul is sitting before Agrippa, and he says this, And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers. He says it again before the king. He says it in Rome. And he says this, For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and to speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am in chains. Why do you share the gospel? Why is there any impetus, any momentum, any sort of drive to be those who share the gospel? Because it's the only thing that offers hope. 
Paul's in chains. Paul plants churches. Paul is whipped. Paul is beaten. Paul is snuck out of a city because he was going to get killed because of the hope that he knew was in the gospel. It's the gospel impetus. It is the moral imperative. Why do we live good lives? Because the Bible tells me so. Kind of. No, because of the hope. Because we want to be a people that when he comes, we want to be a people who prepare the way in such a way that when he comes, we know that he'll say to us, well done, good and faithful servants. How do I know that it is the moral imperative? Paul writing to the young leader, Titus, says this to him. Titus chapter 2, verses 7 through 14. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in all your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. That's what we want to live like, friends. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are be, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. What Paul is saying to Titus is the way that you work for the worst boss in the world should adorn the doctrine of God with beauty because of how you embrace that and live it out. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing hope and sal- bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. Why? Why do we live self-controlled, godly lives? Why do we work for the most oppressive bosses in a way that amazes them, in a way that prophetically points to the coming Savior? Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or First John, John's writing from the Isle of Patmos, or maybe this is before he actually is taken uh, to the Isle of Patmos, but he writes to the churches uh, around him, the churches that he's loved for and cared for. And in one of his letters, First John chapter 3, verse 3, he says this, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Do you want to be pure? Hope. God is saying, don't be pure by knowing certain stuff. God is saying, be pure because you look forward, you wait, you hope, you expect, and you prophetically point to the coming of God. Hope is the gospel impetus. Hope is the moral imperative. Hope is the major motivation for our faith and love. Why do we have faith in God? Why do we love the people of God and others? Well, Paul writes to the church in Colossae, it's because of hope. You turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, or verse 5, sorry. Because, he, he says this, Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Why did they have love for all the saints? Why did they have such faith in Christ Jesus? Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. How do you strengthen your faith? How do you grow in your love? Remember your hope. Expect and await the coming king. Verse 23 of Colossians says the same thing. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Hope is the endurance in the given pain and suffering of life. Nowhere in the Bible Does it say that pain and suffering is something unusual because of something we're doing wrong most of the time? There's a disciplining that comes through God wanting to lead us back to Him. But in the New Testament, pain and suffering are a given. Pain and suffering are a given. To live in this time between times is to know pain and to know suffering. To live... Or love in this time between times is to open yourself up to pain and suffering. You want to avoid all pain and suffering? Run away from love. Run away from community. Run away from having children and loving family and loving the people of God. Because to live and to love in our time is to know pain and suffering. And so what gives us the endurance to get through that pain and suffering? Well, Paul again writing to the church in Rome says these words. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. 
be constant in prayer. He writes again in chapter 15, verse 4, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. And finally, in verse 13, he writes this wonderful, wonderful verse to be remembered. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Hope is what gives us the endurance to go through life. Hope is what turns us from moaners to worshippers. I hate to go here, but I will, because the apostle writing to the church in Hebrews goes here, but hope is what makes us make it through to the end. Hope is what makes us stick to this gospel lifestyle riddled with pain and sorrow, often riddled with mockery and abuse by your own loved ones. But again and again and again in the book of Hebrews, the apostle or the writer, whoever it may be, says it is hope that helps you stick it out to the end. Now, you can't preach that as a gospel message to young people, but as um, Jane said so well, when you're old enough, you realize that a lot of people don't stick it out to the end. And so you kind of say, once you come a Christian, it's just glory and it's wonder and it's joy. It is labor. It is sorrow. And it is pain. And how do we get through it all? How do we stick it out to the end? Well, the apostle writing, or whoever it is in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6 says, But Christ is faithful God over God's house as Son, and we are His house, His people, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope, our hope. We are His people if we hold fast to the hope that is in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 You know, one of those dodgy passages of Scripture. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. And again in verse 18 of chapter 6, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Why is he encouraging us to hold fast to hope? Because it's what gets us through. And because it's easy to let go of hope. Finally, in chapter 10, verse 23, again, the author writes, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And finally, in death. How do we go through death prophetically pointing to the coming king? How do we go through death in such a way that denies the darkness creeping across the forests of the world and brings light? Well, the Apostle Paul writing to those in Thessalonica writes these words. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. He writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. It is hope that makes us go through death differently. It is hope that even in our death, we die in such a way as to point to the coming of the dawn, the final and complete victory, the returning of the king, and the breaking in of the full glory of God. So in these four weeks of Advent, look forward with great anticipation by looking back with intentional remembrance. The only way that you can have hope that He will come again is by looking again and again and again at the fact that He has come already. That He came as a baby, that He lived a life of perfection and obedience, and then was mercilessly and unjustly slain upon a cross, defeating sin and death and rising again on the third day and making promises 
that he will return. So we look forward in hope. We face death in hope. We face endurance and we face trials and tribulations. We share the gospel and we live good, solid, wonderful lives. And we're full in faith of love because of the hope before us. Because we look back to what he's already done and who he is. Above all, hold fast to the truth that hope is not a subjective feeling, but an objective reality. As the Apostle Paul writes to the young Timothy, Christ is our hope. Don't have a Christmas drowned in petty, decaying presents without enjoying the eternal gift of God in Christ. Advent helps you enjoy that gift. 